Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that all of us should not only be aware of, but find ways that we can do something about the destruction of our ocean's ecosystems. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is world-renowned author of more than 12 books, some of them such as Before We Leave You, Beyond the Matrix, Atlantis Rising, and The Cosmos of the Soul. Her newest book, The Emissary, is about a wonderful psychic that is enlisted in the aid of an oil man who tries to find ways to be able to find oil in the Pacific Northwest, but has to do so delicately so that way he doesn't destroy some things like the cetaceans, migration paths that happen up there in the Northwest. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Patricia Corey. Patricia, how are you today? I'm wonderful, and thank you very much for that introduction. (laughs) Well, somebody's got to do it right. Now, tell us how this all started for you. Um, What do you mean by all? The, The writing of books or the emissary adventure? The whole idea of being dedicated to protecting and saving the Earth's oceans. Alrighty. I have been going out, well, I'm an adventurer, and I go everywhere. I go to sacred sites. I go out on boats with whales. I, uh, Well, I'm not on, on a boat with a whale, but <laughs> on boats to get out to the whales, and I swim with wild dolphins. And as, as the years have gone on of me going out and being drawn to be near the whales and dolphins, I have developed an, an incredible connection, as most people do. Uh, I'm also a psychic, so I have a, um, before we leave you, the book that you mentioned is actually messages from the whales and dolphins that I've picked up telepathically. And yeah, about four years ago, I decided that the only way I was really going to be involved as I wanted to be was to swim with the wild dolphins. So I did that. I jumped, took a talk about a leap of faith. I jumped off a pontoon boat in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean off of the Azores Islands and swam with the dolphins. And when that happened, I had, like many other people, a, a very important epiphany. And since then, I've been completely committed to serving them, to helping bring forward the importance of the cetaceans and the dire situations of our ocean. So I've become a real ocean advocate and activist thanks to them. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times people become aware of, uh, for instance, uh, of overfishing in the oceans. Give us an idea of what your experience has been about something like that. The tragic news about our oceans was Mm -hmm. first reported by Jacques Cousteau back about 30 years ago. He said... About 90% of our oceans are dead, and everybody scoffed because it looked like it was still okay. But now we see uh, extraordinarily diminished fishing uh, life, uh, marine life. We have scarcity. We have very sick animals, uh, fish dying in the tens of thousands. We had 70,000 fish wash up off of Marina del Rey while I was in um, Los Angeles last month, and this is occurring around the world. We have miles of of islands they called gyros of plastic, actual continents of plastic in the middle of the oceans. There are five of these. They're called gyros. They're not exactly solid, but they're actually just the soupy mess of plastic that's breaking down. So we have quite a problem in our oceans Mm -hmm. and many different aspects of toxicity, depletion. The plastic is a huge problem. And sound, the invasion of the sacred waters with uh, sonar, engines, jet skis, and drilling, and these things are extremely damaging to marine animals and marine life. And imagining what happened as the devastation of the coast off the Gulf and the Gulf of Mexico, you know, that's the other things, you know, that were out there damaging and trying deep water drilling. That can't be very encouraging at all. No, in fact, the situation in the Gulf is has been reported as several fissures in the seabed, 
where this oil keeps seeping up because they they've probably fracked under there and they've drilled so much that they've just it's just breaking apart. It is a much more serious problem than we are told. And to add to that, um they used chemicals core exit to push the oil supposedly down to the seabed and uh so we've got poison from the top and oil from the bottom. It's quite a dramatic scene in the Gulf. And we have to do something about this. We cannot continue to abuse the ocean like this and expect to survive it, not only mm-hmm. for the whales and dolphins and the and the fish, but the human race and all the living things on the land need oceans in equilibrium. There's nowhere for them to go. <laughs> I mean, there it is. We're, we have completely invaded their home and sort of almost used it as our own personal toilet in many ways. And I say this, and I know that you have a lot to say when it comes to the military uh, and some of the destruction that they have been causing, but just to showcase in point is that I actually served in the Navy, and uh, I was on a supply ship, and I tried to, you know, I remember the first time going out to sea wondering, well, where does our garbage go? Well, this is what happens. We just toss it over the side. Well, when oh, you're tossing over paint cans and just you name it, and I, and I thought about that, and I'm kind of a big picture thinker, I guess. And I thought, here, we're one ship, and we're doing this. Now, imagine how many ships are in the Navy fleet. And there are seven fleets, and that's just the American Navy. That's not to include the British, the South American. You can go on and on and on and see how that works. And then there's also the cruise industry, (laughs) you know, then there's the, the fishing industry. industry. Huge. <laughs> you know, I mean, until you imagine all these ship ships the out there doing what our one ship did. These cruise ships with, <clears throat> you know, thousands of people aboard. I'm sorry, what was that? I say, imagine the, I think we have a little uh, delay. I'm sorry if, we, if I talked over you, there's a little delay. Oh, I see. Our phone connection. Gotcha. What I was uh, saying, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay, what I was saying is so I exponentially started looking at this and realizing, think of all the ships daily that are doing exactly what we were doing, you know, and I just was like, <clears throat> oh, my, you know, what to do about this? <laughs> it, 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 my question is, what is the mindset, and this isn't accusatory, I'm just trying to understand, of dumping a paint, a can of paint overboard. Why is there no uh, idea that one could bring back the garbage and bring it back to be dealt with at home? Mm-hmm. That's the military. I, mean, I, I don't understand. Well, it was just the way it was out there. It wasn't something I wanted to participate in, or did I? I was like, I can't throw this. Yeah, no, no, I'm not being accusatory. I'm just no, no. I understand. understand I just waste. I just I have no idea why they didn't bring it back, or you know, that's just how it was. I think it's because this is the nut of where I'm headed here. We we think of the ocean as infinite, and you know, we can get away with it because it's ocean deep and nobody will notice and it will repair itself anyway and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, of course, there is no, you know, our human toxicity and human waste is depleting and destroying the ocean and it's depleting and destroying the earth. So we've really got to learn rather quickly how to deal with our waste or we're going to be buried alive in garbage. Mm-hmm. Now, it's I know in your book... Plastic. In your book, The Emissary, here is someone who is dedicated to saving the oceans, but she comes to a reality that, well, you know, it not only takes money but political willpower to be able to do this. And it seems to be a reality that we're caught up in, that everybody says, well, we must change this. But you kind of take a look at that and say, you know, how is that possible? Yes, well, she makes a deal. I don't want to call it a deal with the devil, but in essence, The heroine is approached by this oil magnate, and he says, look, if you'll come out on the ship with me, because she's a renowned psychic, she does work for the police, she's located oil in Pakistan, and he finds out about that. So he says, if you'll come out on my ship and help us locate the the, uh, substrata oil pockets, we will do less damage. So in a way, you are doing a, an ecological gesture by helping her us. 
And she says, you've got to be kidding. You're the bad guy here. You're killing the oceans, drilling. And he says, no, we're not the bad guy. We're an ecologically friendly oil company. We've heard that one before. <laughs> and uh, if you help us, in, it, you will be indirectly helping the whales. So she agrees to it, knowing she's making a sort of deal with the devil, but he promises her that he will help her get to the right people to uh, to make change for the for the oceans and the whales and dolphins. And I wanted to portray that what you just as you just brought up uh, this sometimes futile I- effort that we have because the political situation is corrupt, the corporate structure is so corrupt. And yet that's what we've got to work with. That's what we've got to change. Exactly. Now, tell us some of the things uh, that you have discovered. You know, there's the oceans of plastic. What are some other things going on that are flying under the radar of public awareness that should become, you know, to the forefront about what we're also doing out there to the oceans? Well, one of the most devastating things that's happening now and is being brought to the foreground by a few more gregarious organizations like NRDC, is the problem of sonar, the use of sonar weaponry, and the new programs to test sonar, laser, electronic sound, all kinds of, uh, let's say, high-tech weaponry, is being tested now on the oceans, and it's fair game. It's it's um, the Navy has been awarded a five-year uh, time frame to bring it all out, and they're shooting very powerful sonar uh, practice in the oceans. And this is, I believe, it's one of the reasons why so many whales are beaching, because. You said they've got nowhere to go, and that's exactly right. I think that these sounds are so devastating that the only thing they know to do is try to get out of the water. They're also losing their migratory pattern. We're finding whales and dolphins with their heads blown apart. and Often this happens after a, a big sonar test, and it affects their mating. It affects everything because whales and dolphins, have incredible auditory faculties. Their heads are are really, I mean, they're designed to echolocate. So the whole oral factor is extraordinarily important to them. And if we keep blasting these these extraordinarily loud booms, explosions, and sonar, uh, we are causing a lot of them to go deaf or die. And uh, a dead whale or a deaf, sorry, a deaf whale or dolphin is a dead whale or dolphin because without their sound capacities, they can't survive. Mm -hmm. It's very serious. Yeah, it just, so when you decide to make a movement to be able to save the oceans, what are some of the best steps that we can take? Besides being passive and not doing anything, jump in and do something about it, but is it possible? I think that it's such a big question, and I feel that a lot of people are so frustrated because they feel they can do nothing, and that's not the case. First of all, you can throw your support behind an organization that is doing the kind of work that you believe in, and you know, you've know you got different approaches. Sea Shepherd, for example, they're warriors. They're out there chasing the <laughs> Had him on the program, the actually. <laughs> zone and doing wonderful work, mm-hmm. but not everybody mm-hmm. wants to support that style of uh, activism. There's NRDC, and they're a a very huge organization, and they are actually uh, suing the Navy for the sonar, and the suit asks them to, the Navy, to reduce dramatically the impact and the scope of the sonar test to protect the ocean. And then you've got Oceania, which is just gener- just does everything imaginable from plastic uh, to uh, closing down sea worlds. I mean, there's a, there's a really huge effort out there. Save Earth Oceans, my organization, is new. We're still very small. We're trying to uh, chart our course, but we're still trying to get funding and uh, establish ourselves as a viable 
organization as well. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of uh, and we need a lot of help, you know. And mm-hmm. people are sort of maxed out because there are so many organizations asking for help. So what I tell people is investigate. What is the aspect that you feel is most important? For example, plastic. There, and then investigate ocean organizations, plastic, and uh, find one that resonates with with what you believe in, and then help them. And now, um, if I I don't want to just speak without letting you breathe. No, please. I mean, this is why you're on the program is to let people know that you know this is what's going on. These people are doing these things, and how do you want to contribute and help out to do this? Because a lot of the times, things like this happen because there are choices that we make individually without being aware of it. That, again, when you go back to what I was talking about earlier about being on the ocean and here we are one ship doing this one thing, and exponentially you start seeing all these other ships and realize the big picture, you think, oh, my goodness, you know, that people look at a situation such as myself and you realize, but I'm just one person and this is huge. But it was one person making a choice, you know, and that's That's the way to look at it. And if one more person makes a choice and it goes exponentially, it transforms everything, and there's not much money and power can do about that. That's right. It takes the consciousness of asking yourself, what happens to a can of paint that goes pouring down into the ocean, all of that toxic substance? How Mm -hmm. many animals will die? How will it affect the water and um, the plastic garbage and... Plastic is a huge problem. The animal, it's breaking down into plastic residue, and the whales and dolphins are swallowing it like, well, the whales are swallowing it like plankton. They're finding whales with their stomachs blown open because of all the plastic they've got inside them. Birds, too, they're just filled with waste, plastic waste, and it just, they explode. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time you throw away a plastic bag, it ends up in the. It'll eventually end up in the ocean. Mm-hmm. That is a very frightening scenario. Um, definitely, for example, the immediate things are like when we go to the beach, we treat them as our beaches, as our playgrounds, but they're really not. These are the natural boundaries of the ocean. This is not our our human garbage station. Mm-hmm. So, there are people now who are placing plastic bag big garbage bag stations on beaches and going around at the end of the day and cleaning up the plastic, cleaning up the garbage. That is really doesn't take too much. If we would just all contribute to cleaning up our own garbage, at least starting on the beaches, clean up our beaches, that would be a huge start. Mm-hmm. I know that and, uh, I was going to say that in your book, The Emissary, you know, it starts off where... Uh, the protagonist, you know, she is down in Australia where humpback whales have beached themselves and died. And when I was reading that, I was reminded of uh, one of the first devastating uh, situations like that that actually occurred in Florence, Oregon. And that was back, I think, right around 1980, where there were more than 40 sperm whales (laughs) that beached themselves on the beaches of Florence, Oregon. Now think about that. A sperm whale is a deep water whale. I mean, this is a whale that's out there in the middle of the ocean. They dive deep for giant squid and all that. You know, and more than 40 of these beached themselves, and you've got to scratch your head and say, what the heck is going on that would cause something like this? And do you have military bases there, Navy? Uh, I believe they do up on the northern part of Washington, uh, the Woodby Islands area, from what I understand. Sure, Puget Sound, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very... Depressing because that is a military area and that is a huge whale and dolphin uh, sanctuary in a sense. In Puget Sound, I mean, this is where they migrate. Mm-hmm. So most for for forty whales to beach themselves. Sperm whales. That's very important because these things are deep divers. Sperm whales, exactly. <laughs> something very dramatic has to have happened. Mm-hmm. This is not just that they're off course. Something has push them to do that. And in the emissary, I've made it clear that um, they 
they have nowhere to go. These they've got to get out of the water. They're desperate to escape that brutal. Well, imagine if a fire engine drove into your kitchen. Right. <laughs> Uh, you're sitting down at dinner, and a fire engine drives into your kitchen. What's the first thing you're going to do? Mm-hmm. Race out of the house with your hands over your ears, trying to save yourself from losing your hearing. Mm-hmm. And we do this all the time, every day, all over the planet. We completely disregarding the fact that our oceans are inhabited by highly sensitive mammals with highly sensitive auditory functions and the need to echolocate, to use sound to find their way. So if we keep bombarding the oceans with all of this sound uh, there, I, I, I feel that we're going to lose them. In fact, the Navy said they, it, they could possibly have takes, they use the word takes, of up to 15, 13, well, the number gets band, be, banded around from 12 to 9 to 10, Somewhere in the region of 10 million cetaceans could be taken out in a five-year period. Wow. That, that, that means your grandchildren won't probably see cetaceans. Mm-hmm. This is a very urgent crisis on our planet. I think when you think about, well, people might say, well, geez, you know, that sounds bad, but And I remember one of my favorite Star Trek movies was when they go back home. Everybody says it's the one with the whales. (laughs) And you have this giant alien coming, you know, and then it's starting to destroy Earth because it's not getting the message that it was used to getting from deep space from a humpback whale. That's right. (laughs) So you don't realize that you may be killing your own future by killing these animals. That's right. There's this probe, this alien probe, and it's and it's turning off the lights in space because <laughs> it doesn't hear any more whale songs, so it assumes there's no life. Mm-hmm. Very scary. But, you know, we we have to face this reality. How long do we have before all of the cetaceans disappear? And I'm trying my best to bring this information forward, and the emissary uses fiction as a vehicle to be able to reach more people, but it does have a significant echo message in it. In fact, it's being called an an echo adventure thriller. Mm -hmm. And what was funny or interesting about uh, the book is that the sea captain, Jimbo, seems to be afraid of the ocean. Yes. I like creating unexpected dynamics when I write. And so... Such Jimbo, as a dog who loves to swim with a dolphin. Of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Sorry? I was saying such as the golden retriever that loves to swim with the dolphins. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, Jimbo, it's not exactly that he's afraid of the oceans, as much as he has a very deep respect for the power of the sea. And there's a scene where uh, he describes how his friend almost got killed, got bitten, got taken out by a shark. And there's this. He starts off telling it with a lot of humor, and then as he as he tells it more and more, he gets darker and darker, because he it's an ominous thing he has with the ocean. It's a, like a love hate relationship. He's a very complicated character, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm thinking about uh, that, when you talk about that in the book, where his friend was about to be eaten by, as we call it, the whites. I was disturbed to go back to the time when Steven Spielberg created Jaws. And you wonder if a man like that scratches his head realizing the devastation that he didn't mean to create for the shark population, and my understanding is at 90% now. And that's alarming. I mean, I think sharks are one of the most beautiful animals in the ocean. To me, they remind me of a big sea dog. And just to give people an idea, there was a time where down in the Galapagos, off the coast of the Galapagos Islands, that it was illegal. It was like the last shark sanctuary on planet Earth. And they had lifted the ban on fishing for sharks in that area. So now you're allowed to go ahead and go in there and do that because there was nowhere else to to, to fish for these things. And pretty soon, the citizens of Costa Rica were taking a look at this and saying, this is nonsense. And a year later, because of their efforts, they 
uh, were able to enact and put the ban back in place. So now you're not allowed to fish there anymore. But, you know, you just... It just alarms me that people just go about their days, you know, and they don't think about what's happening out there, you know, that you're fishing, for instance, for sharks just for their fins. I mean, they pull these things in, cut the fins, and then throw the animal alive back into the ocean. And it just, oh, my goodness, you know, and then I'm sure people remember the documentary The Cove, you know, and what the Japanese were doing to the dolphins. Yeah. You know, but you can't just passively eat popcorn, feel alarm for a little bit, and then go about your day participating in the things that are causing this in the first place. Well, you know, Daniel, the problem is that people have a... I think that we are so bombarded with bad news and fear and danger and horror that more and more we we just we want to tune it all out because... It's all too much to deal with, so we anesthetize ourselves with the the minutia of our daily lives because the big picture is so unbearable. And then there are some of us who aren't afraid to look at the big picture and who are still going to confront it and try to change it. But it is it is a pretty devastating world we're in, and the solutions are that more more people come out of their cocoon and are able to to look at reality and believe that they can affect change. So we've got a lot of work to do on ourselves and 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 the children because otherwise I don't have a good feeling about the future for this planet if we can't wake up the children and by the way, we know that a lot of very bright children are coming in now, thank goodness. Mm-hmm. But uh, the planet's been very mismanaged, and we can't blame it all on the government. We've got to take our responsibility, like your story of the garbage and you know raw sewage being pumped into the oceans and just our general mismanagement of our own waste, among other things. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it's a big road ahead of us. It's a difficult time. But I'm an optimist, and I believe we can affect change and that enough people are waking up now that we may be able just to do that. I agree with you, uh, and there's no doubt about the fact that, you know, it's getting children to become interested by exposing them to things such as the lives that are within the oceans, to give them the curiosity and to let them know this is what's going on to spark that interest, to light that fire, if you will, uh, to be able to affect these particular changes that need to be made. Patricia, is there a website people can find out more about your work? Yes, the book itself has its own website. Mm. It's called the Emissary dot net. Good read, by and the way, my... folks. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. It really was. At and... first, I'm, I was, you know, first couple of pages, I'm like, oh no, but then it hooks you especially when she starts to meet with the Texas billionaire oil man, you know, and you're like, well, this is getting interesting. And then it just really moves forward. It's a very enjoyable read. Thank you. I mm-hmm. appreciate that. Uh, so, yeah, that's the um, the website for the book. And then my main website is patriciacorey.com. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, Daniel. You bet. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Remember, make a difference. Go and find out how you can do what you need to do to protect our world's oceans. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you again for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past halfway.